How can I help you? Uh, say again? <laughs> Look, dude, I can't make heads or tails of what you're saying. But can I interest you in the entire run of Todd McFarlane's spawn? No? Look, I'll cut you a special deal. Pennies on the pound. I'll even loan you my wheelbarrow. Hello, I'm Cole Hornaday, and I am the Panel Jumper. Though difficult to translate, our muck-encrusted patron of the Four Colored Arts inquiry is relatively simple. He's understandably confused as to the genesis of his kind in comic book lore. I know, I know, I lose sleep over it myself. Muck-encrusted, mossy-backed swamp men are darn near iconic within the medium of comics. Back in the 1970s, two characters rose to prominence, Marvel's Man-Thing and DC's Swamp Thing. And for all intents and purposes, one clearly appeared a rip-off of the other. Well, let's face it, the timing of both these goofy guys' debut was suspect. Man-Thing first appeared in Marvel Comics' Savage Tales No. 1 in May of 1971, written by Jerry Conway with art by Gray Mara. Swamp Thing first appeared in DC's House of Secrets No. 92 in July of that same year, written by Len Wein with art by Bernie Wrightson. Though not quite identical twins, both characters had similar origin stories. Both of the mad scientist variety. <laughs> like I was saying, well-meaning biophysicists working on a super secret formula to benefit all of mankind gets screwed over by the bad guys, blown up, slathered in said formula, plunged into a conveniently located swamp, only to return a short time later, a changed man. So two characters, both from competing publishers, have similar style and ilk. Rip off, you say? Nay. Both characters debuted within months of one another. So one publisher's premeditated ripoff of the other is just not likely. I mean, why bother? It's not like Swamp Men were a hot commodity in the 1970s. No, there's something far more significant to the synchronicity of both these Swamp Dudes debut. But let's hold on to that notion for a moment, lest I digress. And trust me, you don't want me to digress because there is not enough air in this shop to support the effort. Okay, so, truth be told, the 1970s were not the first time that comic book geeks laid eyes on men of the swamp variety. As a matter of fact, writers Jerry Conway and Lynn Ween credit a skoosh of inspiration to a character dating back to 1942, The Heap. The Heap, a resurrected World War I German flying ace and compatriot of Airboy, first surfaced in Air Fighters No. 3 in December of 1942. Mind you, The Heap didn't disappear following World War II and has been seen surfacing on more than one occasion in the modern day. In the 1970s, a short-lived black and white publisher, Skywald, gave the character a brief new lease, and then in the 1980s, Eclipse Comics featured the character prominently in their own modern take on Airboy. Sometime after Eclipse Comics filed for bankruptcy in 1995, Todd McFarlane bought the rights to the entire Airboy character line and incorporated the heap into his spawn mythos, with a slightly different take. This time around, he was the synthesis between a homeless person and a pile of garbage. Wheelbarrow, anyone? I told you there wasn't enough air in here. But wait, the heap wasn't the first of the Muckman ilk. Nay, verily, one can argue that the template for the Swamp Man dates back a few years earlier to a short story by science fiction writer Ted Sturgeon, It. It originally saw print in the pulp science fiction fantasy magazine Unknown in 1940, and decades later was adapted to the comic book page in Marvel's Supernatural Thrillers No. 1 in December of 1972. So one could look upon Sturgeon's It as sort of the urtext for the Muckman subgenre, if they weren't too lazy to pick up anything beyond a pamphlet full of pictures and word bubbles. Read a book. Read a book. The Muck Man, the Swamp Monster, or the Bog God has been shambling around the back lots of human collective subconsciousness for a millennia. We're talking the Green Man, or Jack of the Green in folklore. Nowadays, you usually find his image sitting on a bookshelf next to that cute ceramic gargoyle your sister mail ordered from Toscano when she was going through her goth phase, or hanging on the back fence of your grandmother's garden. But the Green Man is an iconic figure whose roots stretch all the way back to the ancient Celts. The Green Man, or Jack of the Green, has a parallel in the Wicker Man, and yes, Burning Man, a being whose sole purpose is for ritual sacrifice for the benefit of the community. Sometimes referred to as a sacrificial king, 
It was believed ancient Druidic cultures may have actually appointed someone as king, treated him to a year's worth of pleasure, and then put him to death at year's end to ensure a bountiful harvest. Wicker Man, Green Man, Swamp Thing, Man Thing, The Heap, all of these characters experience a sacrificial death and rebirth, and frequently in fire. In the case of Man Thing, even wheeled fire. Whatever news fear burns at Man Thing's touch. Now, this is the point where if we had the budget for it, you'd see smoke and flames rising from Manager Mike's neck. Nobody got this mythological perspective more than Moore. Alan Moore. In the 1980s, publishers at DC Comics were looking for a way to boost sales of the current Swamp Thing title in anticipation of the upcoming Wes Craven film adaptation starring Dick Duroc, Louis Jordan, and Adrian Barbeau. Adrian. Since the heyday of Ween and Wrightson, Swamp Thing was never a big seller, but when Moore came on board, he turned the title inside out. At first, I started thinking about the differences between a hypothetical vegetable consciousness and a human consciousness, and I think it was early on, uh, within two or three issues, I started to come to the idea that this was no longer a shambling heap of muck. This was some kind of plant elemental, potentially some kind of plant god. Moore with artists John Tottleman and Stephen Bissett, gave the sacrificial king slash green man figure the ability to move through space and time, through something more called the green, or the plant consciousness, shedding his body in one place, recorporating it in another from plant matter. Death, rebirth. Before long, DC was no longer calling Swamp Thing a mere horror comic. They branded it Sophisticated Suspense, and the comic book became the first to boycott the comic's code of authority, the industry's self-censoring body. Ultimately, Swamp Thing became the cornerstone of DC's adult comic line, Vertigo. So, from a certain point of view, the whole muckman, bog god, mossy greenback dude comic book subgenre is merely a pop cultural reinscription of the ancient annual fertility ritual sacrifice. <coughs> Don't forget, we open at 10 on Saturdays. <coughs> because we all need a fairy sod father. We'll see you next time on the Panel Jump. I'm no prop comic. This is. Special shout out to Comics Dungeon and AJ Epstein of EMUT and West of Lennon. Thank you for watching.